Greetings and welcome to another lecture in Introductory Psychology. This one is about language, specifically what are the components, the building blocks of language. Now before we talk about what makes up language, we should probably talk about what language is. So it, language is one of those things that we all kind of know what it is, but it can be difficult to define. But here's a working definition. Words or symbols, along with their rules that are used for thinking and communication. Now, languages can be any of a number of them. I mean, there are all sorts of different human languages. There are spoken human languages, written human languages, signed human languages. There's all sorts of different sign languages. There's British Sign Language and American Sign Language and French Sign Language, and they all are very, very different, but they are all languages. There's even a whistled language. In the Canary Islands, it's called Silbo, where they would communicate you know, across wide valleys where shouting would probably not work, but a whistle would. And they actually came up with a whistled language. Now, when something is a language, we have decided as humans, since we are the preeminent and possibly only true language users on the planet, we've decided we can make these rules, that in order for something to be described as a language, it has to have four components. I'm always asked if animals have language because that's where a lot of my research background is. And my usual definition is, well, depends on what you mean by language. But humans have decided that in order for something to be a language, you have to have four things. The first is language has to be symbolic. You use symbols to represent the world, whether it's words or, or, le or an alphabet or whistles. Those are symbolic. It allows us, for instance, to speak about something that isn't in the room with us. I, if I s mentioned that I have a cat, you all know what I'm talking about. You all understand, and I could talk about my cats without, say, showing you a picture of them or a video of them or showing you the actual cat. The sounds cat, those particular sounds, in English, we have decided mean a small, furry, semi-domesticated, carnivorous mammal. That's the semantic part. Semantics says that these symbols have meaning. So symbolic is usually we represent the word world by symbols, and semantics says that these symbols have meaning. Now, non-human animals have gotten this far, at least some have. There is some evidence, for instance, that animals as disparate as vervet monkeys and prairie dogs may have different sounds, for instance, for different predators. Vervet monkeys have been studied quite a bit. They have three major types of predators, these monkeys. They have eagles, they have leopards, and they have snakes. And the vervet monkeys have come up with a way to distinguish between the three in terms of, I mean, what we might as well call words. They have different calls for different predators. And other vervet monkeys know exactly what they're saying. We know this because if you go to the vervet monkeys and you play an eagle call, they all start looking up in the air. Or if you play a snake call, they all start looking down at the ground. Or a leopard call, they all start looking around. At the I mean, they know what those words mean. And it's not instinctive. They learn them. We know this because we have seen the young monkeys literally learn how to do this. And occasionally, by the way, a young monkey will quote unquote cry wolf is that they'll holler that there is a predator coming causing everybody to scatter and everything else. And as soon as the adults realize that there is actually no predator, they have a tendency to, not surprisingly, if you know about humans, would probably do the same thing. They tend to go over to the young monkey that cried wolf and, you know, give it a little smack. <laughs> like, Stop doing that. Um, so this far, animals have gotten. There is no doubt in anyone's mind, as far as I know, that animals communicate. But communication isn't language. We've decided this. Yeah, it's arbitrary, but we've decided this. And it's these next two, these last two, where you sort of cross the line from communication to language. Generativity means that you can take a limited number of symbols and make an unlimited number of messages. All languages have a limited number of words. It's possible to get along quite nicely, for instance, in the U.S. and only know maybe less than 5,000 words, maybe even less than 1,000 words. And it's possible to get along okay because we can take those limited number of words and combine them in an almost unlimited number of sentences. That's what generativity is. And as far as we know, non-human animals don't do this, as far as we know. 
at least not without a lot of coaching. That's a different lecture. Lastly, when these words are put together into new messages, they have to follow rules. Languages have structure. We do not just string these words together randomly. They follow rules. We call those rules grammar. Uh, verb tenses, verb and noun in the sentence. I mean, in different languages have different rules. In English, we tend to put adjectives before nouns. In French, adjectives tend to go after nouns. In English, we tend to have the verb near the front of the sentence. In German, sometimes the verb is at the very end of the sentence. But the rules may differ, but all languages have rules, and we all follow them. That all is also what separates language from communication. So the first two we definitely see in non-human animals. The second two actually we've seen in non-human animals, but not naturally. Generally, they need a lot of help to do that. As I said, there are lectures about that as well. Now, after talking about language possibly being not only speech, but also in terms of written language, whistled language, signed language, I'm going to focus it back onto speech. This is assuming individuals with normal hearing Speech tends to be the first language that we learn, and it also tends to be the language that we know the best. So I'm going to take speech and break it down. The most basic component of speech is called a phoneme. Now, a phoneme is a sound. It's a sound. Do not think of a phoneme as a letter. Okay, English may only have 26 letters, but it has between 40 and 45 phonemes depending on where you learned it. So phonemes are the sounds of the language. And we know, for instance, that even though someone may be speaking English, that someone who learned their English in England will use different phonemes than someone who learned them in Scotland or Wales or Ireland. Someone who learned them in the southern U.S. is going to use different phonemes than someone who learned it in New England or the Mid-Atlantic or the Midwestern states or the Western states or the Southwestern states or Hawaii or Alaska. I mean, you get the idea. We all may be speaking the same language, but we all use slightly different phonemes. So a phoneme is a sound. Now we string those sounds together using rules phonological rules. So th there's rules everywhere. Certain sounds tend to go before certain other sounds. Uh, certain sounds tend to go together. And these rules again vary somewhat by language. There may be ways of putting sounds together in one language that you don't see in another. Um, so it's not just phonemes, it's combinations of phonemes that we see. So if a phoneme is a sound, a morpheme, it's not morpheme, note the phoneme, a morpheme is the smallest meaningful unit of language. It's the smallest meaningful unit, which is not necessarily a word. Okay, in the same way that a phoneme is not necessarily a letter, a morpheme is not necessarily a word. Because if you think back on English class, and you remember when your teacher might have been talking about prefixes and suffixes and verb tenses and all those sorts of things, all of those are morphemes. They all add meaning. So for instance, the word elements it's one word, it's three syllables, it's two phonemes, the two, er, two morphemes, excuse me. The two morphemes are element and ts because they both add meaning. Okay, phonemes, same thing. We have phoneme and ts. <laughs> we have morphemes. Although, interestingly enough, one, one of those phonological rules, say morphemes and phonemes. And you'll notice that we don't really say it with an S. Phonemes. 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 We tend to say it with a Z. Morphemes. Elements of speech. But elements is an S. Phonemes is a Z. Elements is an S. And the reason for that is the last phoneme and element before the S is T, which is T, T, which is not vocalized, is it? Neither is S. S. 
We can do that. Phonemes, the last phoneme in phoneme is m, which is vocalized. So z, z, phonemes. Otherwise, we'd have to go phonemes, which is kind of annoying. That's a phonological rule. A vocalized consonant, when made plural, is followed by a vocalized plural, a z sound. A non-vocalized consonant at the end of the word when made plural is followed by a non-vocalized plural, an S, which would be a whole lot simpler if we spelled the vocalized ones with a Z instead of with an S. But unfortunately, we're kind of sticking with the S, which is part of the reason why people hate to learn English, because it isn't always said the way that it's spelled. At any rate, a morpheme then is the smallest meaningful unit of language. Now these morphemes are strung together following rules, as I said before, and these rules are called grammar. Now grammars include all the rules of the language, word order, uh, verb tenses, you name it, it's in there. There is one form of grammar that I want to talk about just a little more, because when I talk about animal language, then this is going to become important, and that is syntax. Syntax is indeed word order. And the order of words is very important because the order of words carries as much meaning almost as the words themselves. For instance, the sentence, dog bites man. Dog bites man. That's not particularly interesting, right? But what if we change the syntax? Man bites dog. Exact same words, exact same morphemes, different order. Man bites dog is a news story. Dog bites man really is it. Man bites dog is. So you see the difference that syntax can make, the difference that word order can make. It's very important. Without word order, we'd just be talking in what psychologists call a word salad. It's just a string of words all randomly mixed together, and we wouldn't make any sense. And syntax has been one of the big deals in animal language to show that animals can understand word order, that animals can understand the difference between dog bites man and man bites dog, although it hasn't been phrased exactly like that. But you get the idea. So phonemes are sounds, morphemes are meaningful units of language, and grammar is how we put it all together.